That should be the last of the fail-safes. Can you hear me? Hello? I swear, if we've come all this way only for the audio to fail at the last minute, I'm going to be furious. Let me just... Okay, are we good? Alright, that's it. We're good then. Look, I hate to throw out all the grace in a standard introduction, but we're not safe here. I've made a very limited window of time for us to do this, and once it runs out, we're in jeopardy. You've been asking for a look inside the Foundation for ages, and I found a way to hook us up to an internal computer using one of the security drones. But if we aren't careful, they'll know something's up. We'll be taken offline, and then they'll try to track my location. Can't let that happen. They've wanted to get their hands on me for years, and I don't feel like trying to save as much equipment as I can before a containment squad comes and tears the whole building down. I've used the contact to give us just enough time to explore a few entries before the system is aware of a breach. No worries about waking up anything or posing a containment threat to any monsters on site. This is an isolated wing with no cells, and the records we'll be looking at don't concern anything in this building. Most of them can't even be found on any site under Foundation control. You see, there are some anomalies in this world that can't be fully secured, contained, or protected. Tonight, we'll be examining SCP's Most Wanted, the uncontained and highly dangerous monsters among us. Most of the things in here want to break out. Tonight, we're breaking in. Now stand by, I'm going to open the vault door. Okay, we're connected. Looking pretty good so far, so we can relax just a bit, but we still need to watch out. We have just enough time to pull nine files from the most wanted area, ranging in threat level according to difficulty of human avoidance. Code white represents a kind of threat that can be avoided pretty easily, as long as you know what you're dealing with. Code blue represents a situation that's much harder to avoid, but if you keep your senses with you and have strong willpower, you might make it through any encounters. Code Red is what the Foundation really doesn't want anyone knowing about. Threats to humanity that are very difficult or currently impossible to predict, prevent, and take down. As we explore, remember that we can't get certain bits of information. Anything under major lockdown by the Foundation, such as names, locations, and identifying characteristics will be replaced with a note that it's been redacted. Euclid classes refer to those which may pose a deadly threat. Keter classes either guarantee it or can harm serious numbers of people and humanity at large. Our first entry is item number 1155, Predatory Street Art. Object Class, Keter. SCP-1155 manifests as a work of street art or graffiti depicting the form of a humanoid creature with sinewy forelimbs, claw-like hands, and the head and feathers of an owl. The depicted pose is variable, but tends towards a predatory stance with eyes that appear to track the viewer. Anyone viewing this image directly will experience a compulsion to investigate further. Victims describe a nervous fascination and a desire to move closer. This can be resisted with effort, especially if the subject is aware of SCP-1155's anomalous properties. If a subject approaches within six feet and is not in the line of sight of another person, they will be subjected to a violent attack, suffering severe lacerations, dismemberment of extremities, whole or partial removal of soft body parts, and penetrating head trauma consistent with those that would be inflicted by a large beak and or talons. The attack generally takes about six seconds to conclude, upon which both SCP-1155 and the victim will vanish, and 1155 will reappear elsewhere in the usual manner of a relocation event within seven days. Attacks can be halted before this event by re-establishing line of sight to the victim, but this is not recommended. See Record of Incident 1155A. Attempts to track where the victims are taken by equipping test subjects with GPS locators have failed. Based on tested interruptions performed at predefined intervals, the attack follows a defined pattern. The victim will first be restrained, and the eyes and tongue will be removed, 
rapidly followed by the amputation of the hands and feet. The victim will then be disemboweled and the intestines and stomach removed. Death usually follows due to shock or rapid blood loss, but only if the attack is interrupted by visual contact. The fate of victims who disappear along with SCP-1155 at the conclusion of the attack is unknown. Incident 1155A reads as follows. Two surviving Class D personnel used for attack interruption tests were given medical treatment and kept alive in the aftermath of the event. Both were incoherent and could not adequately communicate what had happened to them, though D-89786, whose eyes had been taken during the attack, claimed to still be able to see, and he provided a description of a larder containing bodies of previous victims of SCP-1155 along with the entity itself. D-89786 escaped from on-site quarters during a containment breach by an unassociated SCP and was pursued by local law enforcement, who had been told that he was a severely disturbed patient from a local mental hospital. Responding officers reported they saw the suspect walking into an alleyway, but before they could apprehend, a scream was heard, and when they rounded the corner, it was found that D-89786 had disappeared. The alleyway was a dead end with no visible exits. D-89789, with eyes, tongue, hands, and feet removed before the attack was halted, had been transferred to a secure site. A period of rapid relocating was noted in SCP-1155, during which it was observed in several public places with a posture that suggested hunting and tracking behavior. 1155 appeared for several hours high up on the side of a building in full view of many witnesses, who fortunately could not access it. In view of the difficulties of containment, Site Command made the decision to bring D-89-789 back into the city. 1155 was observed to appear several times on walls, advertisement boards, and bridges along the transport vehicle's path. 789 was observed to become increasingly agitated and hysterical during the process. D-89-789 was transferred to a remote location on the edge of city limits, placed in front of SCP-1155, and visual contact was broken. 1155 and D-789 disappeared, and 1155 resumed previous pattern of manageable relocation behavior. The SCP Foundation has a few areas of the affected city cordoned off and made to look abandoned so they can keep tabs on 1155, but constant relocation by the owl makes permanent containment impossible. Mobile Task Force PI-1 are in charge of finding new areas of residence by 1155 as quickly as it relocates. Surveillance and general population deterrence are set up at the new locations, and the process repeats as soon as the owl moves again. A permanent way to close it off or dispose of 1155 is still being investigated. Any form of damage done to the surface it resides on just forces it to immediately relocate. Be careful walking around in your local city. That graffiti on the wall may be much more dangerous than a few layers of paint. Speaking of the city, how do you normally get around in yours? I do hope you're walking, taking a bike, or have your own car, because our next entry makes public transportation a lot more difficult. SCP-2086 is classified as a Keter object, and for good reason. It's a species of arthropod resembling various makes, models, and brandings of public transport vehicles, typically buses. A newborn specimen of SCP-2086 can be expected to grow to full size within one week. On average, SCP-2086 specimens live 12 to 15 days, with females producing up to 20 offspring after reaching reproduction age at approximately 8 days. Mature bodies of SCP-2086 do not feed, instead living off of nutrients consumed as juveniles. However, only mature 2086 instances display foraging behaviors. When foraging, SCP-2086 are almost indistinguishable from standard automobiles, although closer examination does reveal the steel, wood, plastic, and glass to be a specialized form of chitin. Vital organs such as the heart, brain, and stomach are stored beneath the flooring of SCP-2086's inner chamber. A human body, preserved in a shellac-like substance, typically serves as the decoy driver of wild 2086 entities. Fibrous appendages protrude into the body. SCP-2086 instances use these fibers to manipulate the body, providing a more lifelike appearance. 2086 can unravel their roofs into wings that are capable of lifting the entire organism in flight, which is their standard method of locomotion when not foraging. In addition, the wheels can unravel into long, gray or black legs while the headlights appear to serve as bioluminescent optical organs. The appendages of SCP-2086 instances are abnormally apt at fine manipulation when compared to other species of arthropod. 
Specimens have been observed building crude shelters with the materials located at their nesting grounds. 2086 typically nest in abandoned junk and scrapyards. Juveniles in the wild have been observed removing bus stop signposts and relocating them, typically in a route that leads back to the local colony. Accidental civilian observation of 2086 engaging in this activity is minimized due to the significantly smaller size of juvenile specimens. Mature 2086 will drive along the route laid by juveniles, picking up human passengers. Once a significant number of humans board the body of 2086, the organism releases a substance similar to chloroform to incapacitate its prey. Upon returning to the colony, juveniles will enter the mature's internal chamber. Each passenger is then forcefully removed from the mature body by a juvenile. 2086 will proceed to force the human through a location under their hood, linking to the placement of the steering wheel and driver's seat. Once consumed, hair-like appendages in the driver's seat will pierce the trapped human's body. These appendages serve as feeding tubes, draining blood from the prey. Once the prey has been drained of blood, the feeding tubes will begin to secrete a saline solution into the body. The internal compartment will then begin to fill with a shellac-like substance, preserving it eternally. I was once told that public buses can give you diseases and put you out of commission for a while. Now I know that a public bus can take you out completely. If you step on board SCP-2086, it'll be the last ride you ever take. Our final code white entry is a bit harder to avoid than buses that kidnap and eat people, but only if you're pretty social online. SCP-1715 is a Euclid-class entity known as the Online Friend, and they're anything but friendly. SCP-1715 is an anomalous entity that sporadically joins and integrates itself into small online communities such as message boards and wiki databases. 1715 uses a different name on each website it joins. However, every recorded username chosen by the entity has either included a redacted word or been thematically linked to a redacted activity. All efforts to trace 1715's source have failed. It is currently unknown whether SCP-1715 is a corporeal entity accessing the internet from a physical location, or an incorporeal phenomenon that exists only on the internet itself. 1715 describes itself differently in each manifestation, but always claims to be between 15 and 30 years of age. The anomaly typically targets small but growing web communities that are centered around video games, television programs, musical groups, and similar interests. SCP-1715 has proven capable of manifesting on as many as nine sites at once. It is currently unknown if this is the extent of its limitations or merely the highest number of cases observed by the Foundation. For the most part, 1715 uses proper grammar, spelling, and punctuation with only occasional errors, and displays a high level of knowledge surrounding the topic of the website it participates in. Other members of the online communities frequented by SCP-1715 generally consider it to be affable, polite, enthusiastic, and helpful. Because of its attractive personality and active level of participation, 1715 will often become a highly respected user on websites within a relatively short amount of time. On a number of occasions, the anomaly has been promoted to positions of authority by site administrators. SCP-1715 begins to show anomalous properties once it has established itself as a presence on an online community, usually within eight weeks of its initial join date. At that time, 1715 will send a number of private messages to other site members, beginning with other popular users. These messages generally begin with a declaration of friendship, followed by fabricated details regarding 1715's personal life, and end with a request for the recipient's personal information. If the user ignores the message or responds without providing any factual personal details, no anomalous effects will take place. If the user provides SCP-1715 with factual personal information, the user and their account will become instances of SCP-1715-1 and-2 respectively. Within two weeks of responding to 1715's message, instances of 1715-1 will be injured in a violent incident, homicides, and suicides. Although these events usually result in immediate death, there have been cases of 1715-1 being rendered comatose, brain dead, or similarly incapacitated. Investigations performed by local law enforcement units and Foundation agents have determined all deaths to be apparently non-anomalous in nature and explainable by evidence. In one case, Foundation investigators found evidence that an individual had started planning his murder several years before the 1715-1 victim had ever joined a message board. It is currently unknown if 1715 is somehow influencing these events or if it actively seeks out individuals it knows will die. 
After SCP-1751 is deceased or otherwise incapacitated, the corresponding website account, known as 1715-2, will remain active in its respective online communities, posting content that is consistent with its former owner's personality and writing style. Occurrences of 1715-2 possess the same memories as their counterparts up until the time of their death, but deny that they are, in fact, dead, often accusing the inquiring party of being a troll. 1715-2 will discuss the same topics as their living counterparts, with the exception that they will occasionally post messages that could be interpreted as references to their death. Accounts for 1715-2 remain active as prolific members until such time that 1715 announces its own departure from the website. Once this takes place, all instances of 1715-2 will reply to the announcement with various well wishes and goodbyes before immediately ceasing all anomalous activity. Beyond their apparently symbiotic connection to SCP-1715, there does not appear to be a limit to the amount of time 1715-2 can remain on site. One group remained active for 11 years, analyzing and discussing episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer on a daily basis until the site was eventually shut down by Foundation personnel. You may want to take a look at some of your own circles online now that you've been made aware of SCP-1715. It's nice to have internet friends, but you certainly wouldn't want them to get too involved. Chalk this up to another reason to avoid sharing personal details online. Here's an entry that doesn't care for your personal details. They're after something much more powerful than your name. The first of our code blue entries, SCP-1076, Euclid class, known as the only child. SCP-1076 refers to a species that always appears as a child between the ages of 3 and 5 with an unwashed appearance and long matted hair, barefoot and dressed in ragged clothing. Cursory physical examination reveals signs of moderate to severe malnutrition and bruising and scarring consistent with physical abuse. Specimens of both sexes have been encountered and normally appear to be of the majority ethnicity of their place of discovery. Specimens seem to comprehend simple statements but have not displayed any signs of verbal ability. Vocalizations are limited to simple grunts, sighs, and when disturbed, loud shrieking and sobbing. Specimens are reluctant to meet the gaze of any individual and tend to look downward in the absence of outside stimulus. They will respond to simple questions by nodding in the affirmative or negative. Initial encounters with SCP-1076 occur when a parent discovers the child in a state of apparent distress. These incidents occur in isolation. There are no known cases with any third-party witnesses. Subjects report an overwhelming feeling of pity for the specimen and, in every recorded case, take it into their home. Once inside a home, 1076 begins to monopolize the attention of the parents to the exclusion of their own children. Children already present in the home begin to show signs of neglect and malnutrition and become depressed, sullen, and withdrawn. Behavioral problems such as truancy and running away become frequent, which may attract the attention of school authorities or social welfare agents. Upon investigating, the authorities become obsessed with the welfare of 1076 as well and subsequently ignore the children. An infestation typically ends in the death of the parents and other caretakers as they neglect their own well-being in order to attend to 1076. In the few cases where the Foundation was able to contain an infestation before this occurrence, subjects who were separated from the specimen became violent or nearly catatonic, and repeatedly demanded to be reunited with their baby. If two specimens of SCP-1076 meet, they will attack each other with great force, using teeth and fingernails until one or both are dead. Any personnel witnessing such an attack should be treated for possible psychological trauma. The human instinct to help children in trouble is very strong. The sight of a child in the condition SCP-1076 presents would result in immediate attention by concerned adults. However, because of the effects of 1076 within a person's home, it may very well be that its anomalous properties work when someone first encounters it as well. The inability by human nature to resist a child in distress can be considered as strong as the power of our next entry in a different way. The fear of authority. Whereas the only child is an entity innocent people discover, SCP-973 is the kind that finds you. Smokey is a highly dangerous Euclid-class entity composed of two bodies. SCP-973-1 is a police cruiser resembling those used by state troopers in the early 1970s. The vehicle appears to be in an advanced state of disrepair. Eyewitness accounts have consistently mentioned large dents in the doors and hood, a heavily cracked windshield, heavy rusting, and a loose rear bumper secured with duct tape. 973-2 is reported as a Caucasian male in his late 40s, wearing a state trooper uniform dating from the same time period as the vehicle. 
Subject is described as balding, slightly overweight, and having a handlebar mustache. SCP-973 will manifest at night when another vehicle enters a redacted territory and is believed to be triggered by the target vehicle accelerating over a certain speed. This limit varies, with the average being in the area of 55 miles per hour, but it can range anywhere between 35 and 70. No predictable pattern or connection between differing limits has been found as of yet. When this limit is broken, SCP-973 will appear approximately 0.4 kilometers behind the target vehicle and will chase them down at high speed with the siren and flashers on. This is accompanied by a looping message plate on the target's radio consisting of the word, RUN. In many cases, the target will flee with 973 in pursuit and will be overtaken in 1-6 to six minutes. At this point, Data expunged. Clearance level insufficient. The remains of 34 individuals and 19 vehicles have been found within 6.4 kilometers of the affected roadway. The range of damage done to bodies includes evisceration. Data expunged. Clearance level insufficient. In three cases where the body had been damaged by the impact to the point that visual identification was impossible. Five survivors are within Foundation custody, all suffering from various degrees of mental trauma. The recovered vehicles showcase heavy impact damage, both environmental and inflicted, and severe burn damage to the interior. Addendum 3. SCP-973's area of effect seems to be expanding, as does the window of time that manifestations occur. Security protocols have been adapted to this event. 973's method of operation suggests that there's very little that can be done to avoid it, but we do have survivors, and records of its history does give us two options. Don't go over 35 miles per hour in areas where state troopers hide, and if you do see 973 appear behind you, put the pedal to the floor and hold on to the wheel. Your life depends on it. Our final code blue would be nearly unavoidable if it weren't for its rate of exposure and the ability to perceive things that may be wrong with other people. The efforts of the Foundation to eliminate the threat has also given the general population a much higher chance of survival. The slow burn sloth may seem innocent at first, but it's been marked as a Keter class for a reason. SCP-2774 is any medium which contains SCP-2774-A. 2774-A is a mimetic image of an unknown humanoid entity, presumably wearing a sloth costume. Effects of viewing 2774-A set in between 40 to 100 hours after exposure. Those affected will begin to lose the ability to use cognitive functions or make higher level decisions, except for a period lasting around 150 seconds every 24 hours. This period occurs randomly. 2774A manifests itself in various forms of media, including movies, television, magazines, and in some cases, personally recorded videos or pictures. The sloth is typically located in the background of whatever media it appears in. To date, there have been no instances of SCP-2774 on the internet. A single incident in northern Canada where 2774A appeared on live local television resulted in the relocation of over 4,000 people to Site-116. The image has been found to only retain anomalous properties if it contains hues of red or green. Therefore, those with forms of colorblindness are not affected by SCP-2774. The sloth is believed to possess mimetic properties that are enhanced based on the number of people it affects. Manifestations of 2774A appear to become more common as the number of living victims increases. After the implementation of Protocol XXXP9, reports of manifestation dropped significantly. Tests show that, including the colorblind, SCP-2774 now does not affect the majority of people who view it. It is estimated that under 40% of those exposed to 2774 are actually affected. This percentage is also directly influenced by the number of living victims. When subject to SCP-2774-A's effect, victims appear to move normally based on muscle memory, albeit with slowed reaction times. They are very passive and compliant with personnel, willing to answer basic questions and follow commands, though they display a lack of emotion. While they appear conscious, victims cannot control their actions in any way. Upon entering their 150 seconds of lucidity, victims are often highly agitated and fearful and may act irrationally. Those affected report complete memory of time spent without cognitive function, but no ability to comprehend their actions or affect them in any way. In numerous instances, those affected by SCP-2774 report observing 2774-A while their body is acting autonomously. Perception of reality appears to be lost during that time. 
Subjects are to be considered unstable when conscious and are to be approached with care. Those who have been settled at Site-116 have displayed an affinity to SCP-2774-A. Art, literature, and effigies of 2774-A can commonly be found hoarded in the corners of subjects' rooms. All objects are presumed to have been created while unconscious. These objects are commonly traded between subjects during free hours. Any such items are to be removed and incinerated, and their creators terminated along with any subjects seen emulating the sloth. Dr. Clara Chung conducted interviews with subjects affected by SCP-2774 to gain insight into its effects. The first interview with Subject 866, David, took place on June 11, 2010. Dr. Chung opened by asking what Subject 866 experiences while not in control. 866 replied, It's like you're being driven around, and you're in the passenger seat, except your arms and legs are strapped down so that you can't move. You can't feel anything in your body either. The worst part about it is that you can't hold a thought for more than 5 seconds. I just want to enjoy being able to control myself a bit before I lose it. When you're stuck there, in your own head, you just want to scream, but you can't. You can try for hours and hours, move an arm, a leg, make a sound. It won't happen. You can't even control when you breathe. And then, the hallucinations. The sloth. At this point, Subject 866 looked at the guard standing on either side of Dr. Chong, and then the clock. He began to shake and said, It's watching us. I can't face him again. I just can't. Don't take this personally, please. I'm sorry. 866 reluctantly lunged at the guard at Dr. Chung's right, but was immediately terminated following contact. After this interview, the clock was removed from Dr. Chung's room. Slightly more information came during the next interview. Subject 7444 reported constantly seeing the sloth out of the corner of their eye, and if they gave many details about what it wanted, they would suffer. A final interview conducted with a man named Jason indicated that the anomaly was becoming much stronger. This led directly to Protocol XP9. The details of this operation are only available for level 3 clearances and above, and for good reason. This protocol involved executing 6,200 affected individuals within one month by lethal injection. The order was signed by Dr. Chong, and though her decision does seem extreme, she understands the weight of what's involved as written at the end of the order. If you're on site and reading this, you're probably going to have to take part. Class A amnestics will be available after your duties are done if you so choose. Keep in mind the state of suffering these people are in. This is as much for their benefit as it is ours. Class A amnestics are standard memory wiping devices used after many events involved in SCP operations. Subjects, personnel, doctors, and general population members have all been given amnestics, the strength of which depends on the severity of what has been experienced. A major reason behind the act of keeping records here is due to the frequent use of these devices. You can get rid of all the emotions attached to what you've done, but still keep all of the relevant information and learn what must be retained in regards to anomalies. Amnestics are especially necessary when dealing with our final three entries. Code Red, the most difficult SCP entities to capture, and those which pose extraordinary threats to the human race. Opening this class is going to put our failsafes in jeopardy. We've held out so far, but the standard time for a security drone's presence in this room on the automated schedule is about to finish up, and access for these files has not been programmed for tonight. Once we're in, we've got to move fast and then get out immediately. Are you ready? Okay. SCP-1157, Keter Class, known on the record as the Bifurcating Man, better known among task forces by the codename Hydra. SCP-1157 is a Caucasian male with brown hair and blue eyes. The subject's anomalous nature was first discovered when a body of 1157, designated 1157-1, surrendered to the local police in Arizona, claiming to be a member of a terrorist group. When a bifurcation event occurred while SCP-1157 was in police custody, the subject was brought to the attention of the Foundation and transferred to Sector 7 for containment and study. At intervals of approximately four weeks, all bodies of SCP-1157 undergo a simultaneous bifurcation event at 3.08 a.m. Eastern. While SCP-1157 sleeps, each subject will split into two identical bodies. The event is accompanied by a burst of light and energy which disables any recording devices. Any clothing or other items worn by 1157 will be deposited on the bed underneath the subjects. Protocol G7 is to be enacted immediately after every bifurcation event. The containment area is to be flooded with a gaseous sedative. 
A security team equipped with gas masks must enter the containment quarters and remove one of each resulting subject pairs for euthanasia, study, and disposal. SCP-1157 displays a limited form of shared consciousness. While each body exhibits their own personality and can make individual choices, they also experience the surface thoughts and impulses of all others. Based on subject interviews, at the time of SCP-1157's initial detention, at least five bifurcation events had already occurred. During containment, there have been three observed events. To the best estimation, the current status of SCP-1157 is as follows. 32 bodies contained. 34 bodies confirmed deceased. 45 bodies euthanized during containment. 86 bodies unaccounted for. In additional records for this entry, an interview was recorded with SCP-1157-1. 1157-1 because after initial containment, he did split in two, forming a clone, which was designated 1157-2. Body number one states the reason for his containment. I go to sleep, and when I wake up, there's one more of me. It has happened before, and the previous cloning in containment makes the fifth event. There's 32 of me now, he says, followed by, no, I will not. Dr. Torres, the interviewer, asked if something was wrong. They can hear us, you know. The rest, 1157-1 reported. They're not happy with me. You can hear them all, Dr. Torres asked. 1157-1 replied, yes. A bunch of scared bullies shouting in my ear. I saw what they did. I saw what I was becoming. No. Not me. You. I, I made a choice. The subject shut his eyes and breathed deeply. I'm sorry. There's a lot of them now. It's overwhelming sometimes. The interview ceased at this moment. In the other room, SCP-1157-2 was able to repeat the entire conversation. Additional reports indicate that masses of SCP-1157 clones have come together to train for combat and begun stockpiling weapons. Though 1157-1 was originally cooperative, the clones have all shown the same growing need for resistance. Each raid by the Foundation on 1157 safe houses has been met with increasingly heavy violence. Inside of containment, the clones have attempted riots under hive mind actions, and after the most recent attempt failed, those who survived all carved completely identical phrases into their cell walls. You cannot contain me. Should one escape your grasp, thousands will arise within the year. Elimination efforts for 1157 are well underway. Meanwhile, researchers continue looking for a way to effectively deal with our next entry. SCP-029 is a Keter class, appearing as a pubescent female of Asiatic Indian descent. She appears to suffer from alopecia universalis. Over 80% of her pigmentation is a true black, while the rest of her skin has a complete lack of melanin to the point of albinism. Her eyes are also a dark black in color. SCP-029 has severe homicidal tendencies and has displayed a remarkable ability to use any item as a weapon. However, she has a severe compulsion against shedding blood, preferring instead to strangle her victims. O-29 has demonstrated dexterity and physical reactions four times as fast as the average human. O-29 has also displayed enormous resistance against damage in all forms. Both of these extra human abilities are greatly hampered in the presence of bright or direct light, natural or artificial. In addition, any males who come within the presence of SCP-029, an area defined by her current perception, find themselves pliant to her will. Such males become willing to kill or even die for 029. SCP-029 refers to herself using an agent word that translates as Daughter of Darkness. Interviews with 029 have proven difficult to conduct due to 029's constant attempts to kill or convert all who speak with her. Over her years of captivity, the black patches on her skin have increased in size. SCP-029 was first brought to the Foundation's attempt by an agent working in rural India. An attempt on his life led him to a small cult of men who claimed to be thuggies in service to the daughter. Several weeks of investigation proved that they believed the world to be in the last years of the Kali Yuga, and that by sacrificing one million people to the Daughter of Darkness, they could raise their goddess and end the world. They also believed that only sacrifices performed through strangulation added to the tally. Events led the agent to their mountain fortress where he discovered 029. After the loss of said agent, forces were ordered to conduct a siege which ended in acquisition of SCP-029. Seven years after capture, 029 began showing anomalous growth in her black pigmentation. When questioned about it, she claimed her followers were on the move once more. Investigation led to a concentration of so-called thuggies that had escaped initial foray. After discovering that all followers were there for one of their holy days, a tactical airstrike was called in. 
When the first bomb dropped, SCP-029 awoke from slumber, screaming at the top of her lungs. O-29 continued to scream for the next four hours, ranting and raving that we were killing her people. Since this event, the growth of black pigmentation has stopped completely. O-29 has also redoubled her efforts to escape. And, uh, okay, speaking of escaping, the Foundation just broke one of our failsafes. We are definitely past the time this drone should be connected on the maintenance schedule and the system knows it. Their security is digging in. We've gotta hurry. Word of warning, though. If you're squeamish about violence, gore, mutilation, bad things happening to kids, and some not-so-pleasant bodily fluids, you don't want to experience this final entry. SCP-2852 is a horror story unlike anything else in here. I'm going to give you five seconds to evacuate before we take this on. Hurry though, we don't have a lot of time. Once the second failsafe is broken, we're gone. Alright, let's finish up. SCP-2852, Keter Class, known as Cousin Johnny. Incidents of SCP-2852 have the appearance of a middle-aged white male. Biologically, the cells of SCP-2852 are genetically identical and human. However, incarnations do not have any identifiable organs. Their bodies are made up of fibrous muscular tissue, with teeth and hair being made out of chitin chemically similar to those of the Cicada family. The eyes of 2852, while looking non-anomalous from a distance, are set in the sockets without any nerve connection. While capable of speech despite having no vocal cords or analogous organs, 2852 does not show any grasp of language, speaking in a word salad. Despite this, all individuals at a 2852 compatible event will perceive the subject as speaking intelligibly and will regard its actions as normal unless briefed of its anomalous properties beforehand. Individuals describe 2852 as being playful with a crude sense of humor, and all individuals affected in a 2852 event will refer to the subject as Cousin Johnny. 2852 incarnations appear at various Catholic and Anglican religious functions and are treated as being an established member of the family. Incidents of 2852 are accepted regardless of family resemblance or ethnicity. The entity appears at baptisms, weddings, and funerals, referred to as blue level, white level, and black level events. Currently, no 2852 incident has been found to appear at any other family gathering. All attempts at tracking SCP-2852 before and after an event have met with failure. The entity is able to appear at such events as though they had always been there, even appearing between frames when under surveillance or simply evading any attempt by operatives to keep them out. All tracking devices placed on 2852 have malfunctioned immediately. Each family gathering that SCP-2852 attends results in different behavior from the subject and varying effects. Generally, the result of 2852 appearing at a family gathering generates more serious damage done to children, although adults are not free from its effects. It is worth noting that stopping an SCP-2852 instance before it involves itself in the religious ritual will not prevent its effects from spreading, although they may be diluted. The appearance of Cousin Johnny at an event is enough for its effects to start spreading among the family. When questioned after an event, all affected individuals report a feeling of fondness towards 2852, regardless of its actions during an event. And, hey, are, are you sure you want to stay with me on this? We're about to explore the details of blue, white, and black level events, and they're not for the faint of heart. I'll give you one more opportunity. This entry is a red Keter class for a major reason. <sighs> okay. Hope you have a strong stomach. SCP-2852's effects at a blue level event are present more strongly in the child being baptized, its parents, and any godparents chosen for the occasion. During the baptism ritual, 2852 will involve itself directly in the proceedings, acting as a third godparent when traditionally there are only two, a male and female. Blue level events proceed identically despite the presence of a third godparent until the child is submerged into the water. Immediately, the child's top layer of skin will come off in one piece as though malting. This process does not seem to harm the child. The godparents will then eat the skin between them. Afterwards, the mass will go on as normal, and SCP-2852 will exit along with the family. It is of note that 2852 does not appear at any family celebration held after the baptism. The baptized child has a chance of dying within six months well above the national average. Living children exhibit multiple Cluster B personality disorders. 
Most join anti-capitalist groups, various organizations of government interest, or, if unchecked, will engage in destructive behavior usually manifesting in self-harm, abuse of animals, or abuse of small children. Godparents and biological parents will be rendered sterile regardless of SCP-2852's success in becoming part of the baptismal ritual. Both groups commit suicide within five years of a blue-level event, normally through drowning. All attendees not involved in the baptism ritual are 500% more likely than the national average to have stillbirths. Those who are still capable of having children are far more likely to abandon them, sometimes allowing the child to die in the process. One couple affected by a blue-level event in Ohio gave birth to triplets, which they then tore apart and hung from trees around their property. Past adolescence and into adulthood, children exposed to the Song of Cicadas respond with extreme anxiety and accompanying physical symptoms such as dry mouth, nausea, vomiting, and headaches. Some subjects' agitation escalates into violent outbursts which have resulted in at least 20 fatalities. When interviewed about the cause of their disturbance, no subjects have ever identified Cicada Song as a trigger. Even in one interview involving Level 5 Enhanced Interrogation, the subject never indicated the role of Cicada Song in his attack on a parish, which resulted in 18 dead and 10 wounded, including his parents and three siblings. White Level Event During a marriage ceremony, SCP-2852 will insert itself as a groomsman, and its most deleterious anomalous effects will only manifest after the vows. Once the rings have been exchanged, 2852 will produce various implements that allow the bridesmaids and groomsmen to pull out their teeth one by one. The individuals seem to be oblivious to any pain that would normally take place during such an event, and blood loss through still unknown means does not occur. The bride and groom will be presented with the teeth and will eat them. Damage done to the bride and groom's teeth and jaw are extensive, but any blood loss that occurs will not be fatal. The groom will then, in place of vows, vocalize a currently unknown cicada song, which has been known to reach 140 decibels, rendering the bride and those on the altar deaf. Currently, no groom has been deafened by his own call. At the wedding reception, 2852 will take the role of the best man and give a speech. This speech, as all vocalizations of SCP-2852 will be nonsensical with no patterns to the words used. Individuals will react to the speech with mixed emotions, some crying uncontrollably and others falling into hysterical laughter. After the speech, 2852 will produce a gift for the married couple. This gift currently has always been 3.5 kilograms of human hair of various colors, 13 dead cicada, and 23 human teeth in a cardboard box. DNA testing on gifts has been inconclusive. The bride and groom of a white level event will divorce, on average, two years after their wedding, usually as the result of domestic violence. Any children born during their marriage will have cluster B personality disorders or life-threatening disfigurements. All married individuals attending the event will find themselves unable to have children despite a lack of detectable changes to fertility-related biology. All children involved in a white level event will avoid romantic relationships, and 9 out of 10 commit suicide by the age of 18. Roughly half pull out their teeth until blood completely blocks the airways, and the others bite their own wrists until death occurs through blood loss. Black Level Event Black Level Events are notable in that any attempt to disrupt the event through any means result in the actor becoming a participant. Currently, there exists no way to stop or end a Black Level Event. Any attempts at barring SCP-2852 from the church or funeral home result in him simply appearing inside. During a black level event, 2852 will take the place of the eulogizer, even if one was not meant to speak during the mass. The speech, as any vocalization by 2852, will be nonsensical with no patterns being found. However, as the subject proceeds, the individual closest to the body will open the casket and produce a long knife. The knives produced during a black level event are not seen before the event and disappear after. The individual will then exsanguinate themselves, normally from the wrist, but there have been events where individuals have slit their throat. In turn, two by two, each attendant will use the knife to pour their blood into the casket. Children too young to exsanguinate themselves are helped by adults. Despite many losing enough blood to result in death, no physical effects are seen in participants. SCP-2852 speech will eventually turn into the song of an adult male cicada. All participants will respond with the same call, despite the song of the cicada being limited to the male. Cousin Johnny will stand at the pulpit until each individual has bled themselves, and then will walk to the casket and vomit a mixture of blood, wood pulp, and dead cicada. Once finished, the funeral mass will go on as normal, and the casket, filled with blood and 2852's vomit, will be taken to the cemetery and lowered into the earth as normal for a Catholic or Anglican funeral service. 
Black level events can end here, but if a family gathering was planned to take place after the funeral, SCP-2852 will attend. 2852 will, once all individuals affected have arrived, vomit a similar mixture of blood, wood pulp, and dead cicada into a bowl. This mixture will be primarily eaten by the affected children. After this has been consumed, 2852 will give another speech of nonsensical words without patterns, strip itself, and lay upon a table. The participants then will eat 2852's flesh until there is nothing left. During this, SCP-2852 will still vocalize, even when suffering from mortal injuries. Participants have been known to carry on friendly conversation with SCP-2852 while eating him. Children unable to chew whole food properly will be fed mouth to mouth by any caregivers. All participants of a black level event will break from their family either through suicide, moving, or divorce. Every individual involved in an event will be rendered sterile. Domestic violence and participants of black level events will usually be of a cannibalistic nature, resulting in the death of one or both individuals. Six out of ten children involved will murder one or both of their parents before they turn 18. And that's the last of our red entries. Cousin Johnny, the ultimate uninvited guest. And speaking of which, we're all uninvited guests and security's about to crack the second failsafe. It's time for us to break this connection. Thank you all for joining me in the dark this evening behind the four foot thick concrete walls of the SCP Foundation. Major thanks to all of my supporters on Patreon whose contributions helped us pay the bribes needed to get inside of here and hire enough hackers to hold out this long. Their names will automatically play after the connection breaks, I made sure of it by the coding, stick around to check them out. Once more, I'm Nick Nocturne, and we're getting the hell out of here. The second failsafe broke, and they just found the third. I'll see you again real soon. Sleep tight, and wish me luck. I'd really hate to be incarcerated. Good night.